All right, good morning, everyone. I think it's just before 10 o'clock. I'm very excited to see that we have some people actually tuning in to us this morning. This is the first of our Doc Talk speaker series. We're excited about this as it's a way to engage our community and keep our heads in the game as we go forward. So the idea is that we'll have a variety of speakers um, presenting things that are maritime related, uh, environment, related, and also some people from our community. For example, upcoming will be an author, Jim Lynch, uh, wrote The Highest Tide and Before the Wind, among other things. Wonderful. Um, and in between, I'll be doing skill sessions like this one. We're talking about a particular project that's happening on the ship. So the next one happens to be when we will be hauled out. You can see the underside of the ship and what is going on. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we have an excellent ground control team who will be monitoring that and sending them along. Um, and also, if you want to, su to subscribe to the channel, our YouTube channel, uh, the link is in the chat, and that will give you updates about the other upcoming subjects. So uh, it is, yeah, just now after 10 o'clock. So I think we'll start. The best way, uh, I believe, to do these things is by doing them. So we're going to start. Uh, the reason I chose Seizings as, a, as an opening session is that if you're watching this, you probably know some knots. That's good. And seizings are a logical next step to add to your skill set. It's a very common thing to be doing. You're going to do a lot of them in your career. If this is what you do, or if you come and volunteer on a ship every now and then, it's good to have this in your back pocket. Um, there are different kinds. And uh, what a seizing is, you'll soon see as one is completed, but it's a way of using friction to hold something together. So we have some here in our shrouds. They're a little hard to see because they're painted black. Um, but the shroud is connected uh, to itself and held in place just by friction between the two sides. So it goes like this. Uh, if the purple is the shroud leg, then we have the green seizing is just squeezing the sides together. And that works because it creates enough friction in between the shroud legs, so much so that that counteracts the force of the shrouds and it holds. Uh, these are very handy and a very old idea. And they still work very well. So we'll start with a flat seizing. Here we go. Um, we're gonna use tarred nylon stain twine. This is pretty standard stuff. We like it because it's strong um, and it is also a little bit slippery so we can work with it, but it is not so slippery that it doesn't hold. It's also not so gummy that you can't pull it tight. Um, as you do more of these, you'll know exactly how much twine you need for particular applications. And it's very professional to use exactly the right amount of twine. You have just the tiniest bit left when you're done. Uh, it means you really know what you're doing. So this flat seizing, um, we're going to do it two part and that's an option and I'm also going to do it hand tight and that's, that's an option I'm selecting. So for this example, let's say this is not permanent enough to warrant being spliced in place. If it was more permanent, we would splice it. Uh, for this example, we have tied something here, but we don't want to worry about it all season. So we're going to put a tail seizing on. So I'll move you or you can see a little more in close hope no one's getting seasick we haven't even left the dock so what i'll do for my two-part seizing is i'll start by send i have both of the ends in my hand uh, and i for this i used a fathom and and uh i call it a shoulder it's a little more than a fathom and a half i'm going to split the two ends around either side of the shroud leg and pull them through so what i'm doing here is i've just folded the twine in half and in this case, I'm gonna work up toward the tighter side. And when we set this up, notice what's happening. We want the standing end to be straight. So when this comes under tension, uh, the standing end needs to be straight and the bitter end wants a little bit of slack so that as the knot settles, um, it's allowed, you're allowing for that. So it can still stay in the proper orientation. 
So I'm setting this up nicely. So here are my two parts coming through and I'm just gonna set those up nice and perpendicular to the rope. And then I'll start. So because it's two parts, I'm wrapping two pieces of twine around as though they were one. And I'm just gonna pull on every time like so. Uh, the reason to do something two part is just that it's faster. So for every hand motion, I have two passes of twine. Anytime you're doing a tail seizing, which is a specific uh, seizing that we're doing here, it's hand tight. The tension is in the knot. Uh, there's no reason to spend the time using your spike to tension that. We'll do that in a later example. So for now, I'm just pulling hand tight, keeping these passes nice and flat and parallel. Working along. Notice I am still trying to get it snug because I need to create that friction to hold it in place. And cramming these nice packed down close together. We want this to be just over square. So just freshly rectangular. Uh, maybe one more. I'm real, running a little low. <laughs> Let's try this. So I'd say that is um, just over square. Now to finish, the two pieces are gonna split up. They're gonna go different directions. One of them is gonna go in through the front toward the back in between the pretend, in between the rope legs. And the other one is gonna keep going around the back and then it's gonna come in from the back to the front. So before I tighten these down, I wanna make sure I can sink them down low. So I have one finger here, I'm holding the tension while the other uh, hand is gonna pull these down nice and snug. So I wanna pull that down close to the rest of the seizing before you pull it through. And same thing with this one, we wanna pull this down in place before we pull it all the way around. So now what we have are the two strands pointing different directions. They're each going a separate way and they're gonna switch sides. So they both go down and then they both come up. So we're doing now the frapping turns. These are important. Um, any seizing, even if it's hand tight, you want to put on frapping turns, that's well worth it. It's significantly more strong and durable with frapping turns than without. If you ever do an experiment pulling on these, you'll see that immediately. So always frapping turns. And here we're going to start with a, we're going to finish with a reef knot. So we'll just go right over left. But we want to make sure this uh, tightens in the inside, up in here. Pull that snug. And then for the other part, we went right over left. So now it's left over right. Same thing, I wanna make sure it tightens in place. The reason that we worked our seizing this direction is so our knot would finish here where it's more protected than down here. Just gonna pull snug again. This is a hand tight seizing. So just pulling snug there. And we're done, we'll cut off the tails flush like this and in the back. And there's our flat seizing. So again, that's a flat seizing because it has only one row of passes and we elected to do it middled two part and we also elected to do it hand tight. In this case, we did a tail seizing holding the end of a knot in place where the standing end is tight and the bitter end has room for the knot to settle. Are there questions I should answer now? Looking in the chat. Okay, don't see any questions. If yours are there, uh, Amy will figure out what's going on. Okay, so uh, next up, the round seizing. Uh, round seizing is the more permanent version of a flat seizing. It's the one you'd use in anything structural. So if your ship is from say 17, 1800s era, it is held together with fiber seizings, I suppose the wire seizings like we have here. And they're gonna be round seizings likely. 
more on that later. Um, so we'll need some more twine here. So I'll measure, oh, let's say two and a half, fath a fathom, by the way, let's do this where you can see it, is a far thumb, that one, to a far thumb, that one there. So a fathom uh, is six feet. And again, you should know how to make an actual fathom on yourself. So for example, if I wanna make a fathom, I pull out an arm span, my wingspan, and then I have to go halfway to my elbow to get an actual fathom. So it's, that's good to know how to measure actually six feet. Uh, but obviously in this case where you're just measuring for yourself, your own fathoms are fine. Okay, so for our round seizing, unlike the flat seizing example, we're gonna do this single part. So the twine is gonna go around one time all by itself. So I am gonna start with a cow hitch. I didn't do that with the uh, two part seizing because there's no need for it. And this starts with a cobbler's splice. I'll try to do this up close where you can see. So I don't know if that's focused, looks okay, yeah. So I'm gonna do a splice with the same twine here, but instead of splitting the bitter end and using each strand individually to weave like in a normal splice, the entire strand is gonna crash through, still against the lay, but the entire strand is going through. The reason for this is that it is much faster and it is perfectly strong for even permanent structural seizings, the amount of tension on the initial pass is not so much that this isn't okay. So we'll do three of these passes. Um, notice I'm going every four strands, it doesn't have to be exactly that, but you just wanna make sure you don't tuck it under the same strand of the original part every time. Okay, so here's my cobbler's splice. I've just jammed the entire end through three times and I'm gonna pull back here to start. So now I have cow, I have cow hitched this um, in place. Kind of set this up snug. Um, yes, it matters which way you go around and it depends on what you're doing. Usually you're working toward the tight thing, closing seizings, uh, throat seizings, that's something else. That's another lesson for another time. Uh, for now, in this example, we'll just work down. Um, I have a lot of twine here. This is gonna be annoying to pull around all the time, so I'm gonna make a skein. Um, and even though this is a uh, right-hand laid twine that I'm working with, I'm gonna do figure eights. So I'm just wrapping this and figure out eights around my fingers um, because I want the twine to pull out evenly and despite uh, the theory of it, this works better in practice. So unlike your C gasket for the skein, uh, I do want to be able to pull out the twine as I work. That's the whole point. So I'll bundle this up using the other side, the, the bitter end. Um, and you can do a clove hitch or some variation of something like that. I tend to do something a little more woven. I don't think you can see and it's not very important right now. Okay, here's that. So now I have my skein. This is easier to work with. Uh, but before we get going, this is gonna be, as we said, a structural seizing, a permanent, being a relative term, uh, seizing. So just pulling on this is not gonna be tight enough. We're gonna tie a marlin spike hitch and use that to make a handle to pull on. It's gonna be hard to see, so I'll tie it uh, first with something big. Unfortunately, if you look online, uh, they don't give you very good instructions. So uh, professional mariners always tie this with the spike. You don't tie it beforehand and put it on the spike. So it works like this. Um, here's your twine or rope, whatever it is. Cross the spike over, pointing. I'm gonna say right and left as, as I see them and if you have to switch them, I'm sure you're smart. So here we go. Uh, my spike is pointing over to the left. I'm gonna pinch uh, the twine with my thumb and then I'm gonna roll the bottom of the spike so I point down and then I'm gonna roll the spike so I point up and to the right of the standing end. 
And now I've made a particular loop with my spike in it. Now I'm gonna pass the spike behind the standing end and take this loop and just fold it over the end of the spike. Here's an important part. The knot should stay pretty open like that. Some people make the mistake of letting it collapse in the back. That's not what you want because it won't let go when you're done. So, ugh. case in point, the, uh, here we go. Marlin spike hitch should, should stay pretty flat and open like that. So you've made for yourself a handle you can pull on, but also when you're done, you take the spike out and the knot goes away. We'll do it one more time. Uh, left-handed, if you're left-handed, spike goes over this way. Point the spike down <laughs> and then to the left of the standing end. Duck the point of the spike behind the standing end. Roll that loop over the end. Keep that knot open. There you are. There's your handle. Okay. So here we go. We'll move you in close again. All right. So I tie my Marlin spike hitch. I don't need to pull too terribly hard on the very first one. And like the other, of course, one of my fingers needs to hold. Ooh, my uh, demonstration rope is moving. Ooh, here we go. Okay. One of the uh, fingers is going to hold the tension. And just make sure to catch the end of your cobbler, splice that tail, and tuck it inside. So notice a few things about the way I'm doing this Marlin spike hitch. Um, one is that I'm tying it really close to the seizing. Um, we're using nylon same twine, and if I tie the knot out here, all I'm doing is stretching the same twine. Well, that's not the point at all. I'm trying to tension the seizing. So your marlin spike hitch needs to be done really as close to the seizing as you can manage. And the other things, don't pull like this. It looks obvious from your perspective, uh, but it does happen. Pe people pretty regularly do stab themselves. Uh, with Marlin Spike, so don't don't join that club. Okay, and I'm gonna go around here. So these should be nice and perpendicular to the shroud legs. And I'm just pulling comfortably. Notice the the time that I'm holding it is after after the curve here. You know, it comes around. That's where my thumb's on it, not on the straightaway, but just after the curve. And I'm only going to pull once every pass, once for every loop. But you should see, I need to pull the initial elasticity out of that nylon stain twine so that it sinks in and sits flat with the others. So. <laughs> this is a good time for me to answer questions if there are any. Let's see if there are any now. No questions. Okay, I guess you guys already know this. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one option, the one that I'm doing now is I'm just pulling with my Marlin spike. I've made a handle. That's good. That's better than pulling it by hand. If And that's fine for something structural. Um, my example is shifting here. Uh, it's, so just pulling with your Marlin spike is fine for something this size, even if this was structural standing rigging. However, if it starts to get bigger, uh, just pulling isn't going to be tough enough anymore. So at that point, you're going to switch to a different method. Um, and that method is to use your spike as a lever instead of a handle. So the way that works, uh, tie the Marlin spike hitch like before, but instead of just pulling on it, I'm going to Put the spike parallel to the seizing. And I know you'll notice I'm doing this. I usually kind of hold on to the other end of the twine in my hand. And I'm gonna use the spike as a handle and lever around. And I can get even more tension that way than by just pulling on it. So here I'm going round and round. And I should be making sure uh, that these turns are packed nice and close together. That's another um, advantage of using the spike as a lever. When you have it cinched up next to the others, you can kind of be pulling up. 
as you go. So if your seizing is, uh, let's say you're doing it with size 72, say twine, anything like that, you need to be at least levering your spike around, not just pulling. And the stage after that, um, you would start using a mallet to, for tension. And uh, that we're gonna do in another lesson on lashing and not for this time. So um, my skein's getting a little bit loose. I just wanna tighten up the end so it doesn't all fall apart on me. And I'm gonna come around again. So this one, like the flat seizing, we want this to be just over square. So just newly rectangular as we go around. A couple pro tips. Uh, obviously in this case, I'm not putting my spike back in my belt every time. You shouldn't need to do that. You shouldn't need so many hands to be passing things around. A lot of working in the rig is just efficiency of motion, which of course comes with experience. As everything else does. Uh, something that's happening here, I'm letting this happen so you can see it. Um, and also I have just an example. Because I'm pulling only this way around, the two legs are trying to roll so I'm pulling this way every time, which means this rope is trying to roll around. Um, in some cases, uh, for example, the tail seizing, that doesn't matter. And in other cases, it might. So you may preset whatever you're seizing with them situated um, not, not even 45 degrees, but just a little bit out of a plane so that as you seize, as you work, they come into a plane. That's another thing that's common in rigging is you you kind of preset for the what you expect the outcome is gonna be. For example, you calculate for stretch ahead of time or something like this. You could take into account that the, the one leg is gonna roll around the other. So still going here. Uh, let's see, we're close. Maybe one more. Let's do this one. This looks, I think you, you get the point also. All right, so for this last one, I am done with my spike now for a bit. Um, we've been working this way. Now we're gonna turn around because it's around seizing. There's gonna be another layer of passes that work up this direction. So to start working up the, that direction, when the twine comes around, we're gonna feed it up under itself and make a hitch but I still wanna pull this tight. So just let it sit loosely like that. I haven't pulled it all the way through. Um, and I'll pull on this one more time. So I still have tension in that last turn, um, but my twine is already preset in it. So here's a hitch. I'm just gonna roll it to the outside of the curve because it'll hold the tension that way. And I can let go, which is good because it's time. For a nerd burst. So I can't help but say this, uh, the way that this is working, uh, the friction that we're creating in the seizing is equal to the coefficient of friction, which has to do with how grippy or how slippery, in our case, the shroud is, uh, times the normal force, which is the component of force that it's at a 90 degree angle to the potential motion. So here's the normal force going into the seizing. Uh, that's also the origin of the Norman pin, which is at 90 degrees to the wood that it's through. Uh, and I digress.
So um, back to our around season here, we are ready for the riding turns or the covering turns. Um, and these are gonna be a little less tight than the turns below. I didn't do a very good job here because I was uh, talking to you. Um, these do not need to be spike tight. We're just gonna pass the covering turns around the seizing on the outside. I'm just gonna pull these hands tight. Uh, the first one it is the most likely one to sink in between the bottom turns. So the first one, here's the trick, don't pull it too tight. The other ones, uh, your original round turn should be so tight and closely packed that it's hard for you to by hand pull this twine in between them. It shouldn't, it shouldn't let you do that. So I'm just tugging on these hand tight. Um, and again, they're going in the grooves in between the passes of the woo, original round turns. So the purpose of these riding turns is not so much strength, although it does help the whole thing kind of hold together a little more. What it really does is provides chafe protection and uh, UV protection with our modern materials that we're using are susceptible to UV degradation a lot more than uh, rotting or something like that. My skein's falling apart, but I don't, I'm not bothered at this point. So you can see how much this is twisted. And I, I wanna make sure that I let that happen also so you can see it, you'll remember it better. So this is twisted. It's kind of hard for you to see though, um, due to my pulling in one direction all the time. So again, if it's something like shroud, a shroud lanyard that you want to and nice and parallel in a plane. You wanna preset those to counteract that. Okay, here we are coming around to the top. And of course I never do a good job when I'm explaining. So this came out a little uneven, uh, that's okay. So for the last to finish, um, you only have one bit of twine it's gonna come through the rope here. I'm gonna go from the back. And just like the other finishing, I need to pull it down close to the seizing uh, before I pull it through. And obviously if I've squeezed these nice and tight, uh, that should be a little tricky, but doable. Right there. Okay, pulling that through. And because this is a spike tight seizing, I'm just gonna give that a gentle tug. Just so it settles down. And now we'll do the frapping turns. So these go 90 degrees from, excuse me, the original turns. So originally you're going this way. Now our frapping turns go the other way. And same deal, this needs to sink up high into the rope. Don't kill your fingers doing this turn. Don't worry about it too much because you're gonna get it down in there with your spike. So up on the top, um, this second frapping turn is crossing this one. So instead of um, coming in a row, this second one, it's coming from my right-hand side crossing over to my left-hand side so that there's a cross of the frapping turns in the top there. So we're not too worried about because see how that frapping turn didn't sink in very well? That's okay, we'll deal with that like this. Now I am gonna lever my spike. Um, I'm putting the spike in the space between the two ropes and levering down. And usually you have to re-pick or uh, set up your grabbing point again. And same thing, I'm holding the twine and levering down with my spike. And you should be able to feel when it kind of settles into place and stops turning. So that's nice and all the way down. And as you do this more, at some point, not when you're first starting, but when you, when you have some momentum sailing, you will break the same twine and it'll probably be about at that point in the season. Uh, and then you start over, uh, but then you know, how it feels before the same twine breaks. Uh, wire for the record gets a little warm before it breaks, so you have a heads up. Uh, fiber doesn't do that. 
Okay, so we've crossed over on the top. My fabric turn's coming down to the left. I'm gonna cross on the bottom again for two reasons. It's a little more grab and also, and here I am coming back through the rope strands. It sets us up better for the flat knot at the end. So I'll tension this second frapping turn and then we'll do the knot. Same thing, I'm just levering straight down. And again, I have to re-pick, do that one more time. Uh, the re-picking is because I'm levering, my lever spot, my fulcrum is moving. So it ended up not wearing one. There we go, that should do. Uh, now we'll finish with the flat knot, and that's gonna be really hard for you to see. Uh, so first we'll, we'll show it. Okay, so here we have uh, the rope, we're looking down, and then here's the green seizing, and then here's a uh, one frapping turn in green, and the last frapping turn's coming up in red. It goes from the middle, down in the middle between the two frapping turns, off to the right, around over both frapping turns, and then it's gonna go up through the middle as well. So down through the middle, off to the right, over the top, and then up through the middle again. We'll do it in big rope and then we'll do it tiny. So, okay. Let's say these are the, the frapping turns. So they're the the two parts in the middle, these are the frapping turns and this flat knot, what's gonna happen is you take your, your bitter end, it goes down in the middle and off to the right. Then over top of both of the frapping turns and then up through the middle again. So what I end up with is actually a lot like a reef knot, but I've only tied it with one side. We'll do that one more time because I know you can't see it in Saint Twine. So here's the two frapping turns. And I come off whoop, down through the middle, off to the side, over top of the frapping turns, which don't want to hold still. There we go. Over top of both frapping turns, and then up under again. Here we go. So this is our finished flat knot and that should suck right into the seizing. Okay, so doing this here, I've got to stick the end. Ooh, also notice how much twine I have. Enough to work with, but not too much extra. I guess I could have been that much shorter. Um, it's hard to jam the twine under, so you're gonna use your spike. The twine wants to go in the middle and off to, uh, in this case, the left from my perspective. So my spike's gonna go the opposite way. And here's the trick. You just want a small, a small amount of your spike. Don't put in any more than you need because you're gonna lever um, slack into the turns that you just tightened. That's not what you want. Also notice my spike is flat. That's definitely what you want. If you buy these, they usually come round and you want it flat. It's much more functional for a lot of reasons. Here's one. Um, so I've got my spike in. Now I'm, I've got a bite of the rest of my bitter end, but it, I've got some slack in it. So I've just hooked the bite over the end of my spike. And then I'm gonna, holding tension on the bite, just roll the spike a little more. Here we go, just roll, try to keep my elbow out of the way where you can see it. Roll the spike through. Uh, so you've pulled your same twine through that way. It's a good technique. And before you do the other side, you want to pull this up all the way above the seizing. So that first turn is above the seizing. Here's the part where I cross over both wrapping turns. And this wants to go um, up into the middle this time. Same process. My spike has to go the other way. 
not too much, just a little bit, and make a bite in your bitter end. A bite's just a fold of the line. Um, and same thing, roll this through. So now I've pulled the same twine out. Similarly, I want to pull this up above the seizing before I get too excited tightening it. Pass this back between the legs. And you know, here's a time to be careful. I'll do it without first so you can see. See how the same twine tries to curl? It's because it's getting uh, squished as it's going through. So because you know that's going to happen, you want to go ahead and pull it so it's a small-ish loop. Must be tight. <laughs> um, because I can't pull it with my hand, so that's good. Pull a little bit. Uh, but what I want to do at the end is make sure to keep your thumb on this, keep your thumb on this loop so that it cannot turn into a pig's tail and get stuck. I just want to pull pretty tight. I'm going to lever it one more time. My spike in the back of the wrap board. So the knot should sink up pretty well in between the two strands. Uh, again, you want to put that in a place where it's kind of buried safely, not at the end. And that is secure. You don't need uh, an overhand knot at the end. Uh, you've already you already have a knot that is plenty tight. So here we go. Just cut this off, flush in the back. Ah, yeah, could have saved a couple inches there. So I'll, I'll remember that for next time. Um, a clean fathom and a half. So here we have the round seizing. Pretty stiff and dense. Uh, that's your. Your standard structural seizing on a ship. Okay, surely by now someone has a question. Leslie Lynn, hello. <laughs> uh, do you grind your marlin spike flat? Yes. Uh, yes, you do. So mine has a duckbill taper. So it looks like this and like this. So it's a lot easier to get it into rope. Uh, without a damaging something if you don't want to, or without prying too much slack if you don't want to. What is the breaking strength of sane twine? A lot. Um, I don't have that in the top of my head, but you can look it up. Uh, many, many foot pounds. Uh, we can look that up and put it in the chat. Actually, someone could Google that. Cue the ground, ground control, Google. <laughs> Breaking strength of uh, three strand nylon same twine. Um, is it a permanent splice or does it need to be replaced seasonally? Ooh, Jenny, would you reiterate your question? I'm not quite sure what you mean by the permanent or seasonal splice. I'm scanning. Christopher Finnegan, hello. Gracious. <laughs> it's a ratio that ideally dictates the size of small snuff that should be used relative to the size of what's being sized. Is there a ratio? Probably. Um, I guess that sort of goes by experience. So it's standard for, I'd say, traditional schooners um, to use 48 gauge same twine, maybe 36 for their seizings. And as the ships get bigger, then the seizing stuff gets bigger as well. So um, on barks, you start using more like 60 as your go-to size, 72 for some bigger stuff. That's just off the, off the cuff. Is there a way to look it up? Um, yeah, that's something that's sort of interesting that's happening now is that we're starting to apply uh, math to things that used to be done on experience and the experience did narrow in what worked 
Um, but it's fun for us now as we're trying new materials. Uh, no one has experience on, uh, for example, how much spectra is needed for <laughs> things. Uh, we're, we're using math for that, and that's that's pretty interesting. So something you could figure out is, you know, if you put on so much tension in the seizing, then what is the, the normal force you're creating, squeezing, and then therefore what is the friction um, that would be needed? Okay, I'll look. Okay, when would you use this as opposed to the first flat seizing? Okay, so the flat seizing is for things that are less tension or potentially or temporary. So this is something, this example was a tail seizing. There shouldn't be tension on it really. Uh, it just helps kind of hold the orientation of the knot as the knot settles. Um, and also makes it something that the bosun doesn't think about during the season, they don't worry about it. So the flat seizing is for less serious applications or things that are temporary. It's quick because it only has the one layer of turns and the round seizing with two layers of turns, uh, the regular round turns and then the riding turns. It's more permanent. It's a little bit stronger. Um, when you pull test them, it is a little bit stronger. Just the whole thing holds together better. Um, and again, this is considered more permanent and structural because it has that extra layer of chafe and UV protection. So when other ropes are running around hitting it, the sun's beating down on it, you're not damaging the holding round turns um, of, the, of the seizing. Can you show the bite around the spike in the flat knot? Mm. Yes. Uh, let me think of a way to do that. Yeah, let's do it bigger because that is hard to see. So let's say that Ooh, I don't have enough. Ah. Trying to do this up close for you. Just need a, a bigger um, or a longer line. Okay, so here are my frapping turns. And I need to get them through, but I don't have room. Oh, can you see this? Okay, so kind of need another hand. <laughs> Great. Here's my frapping turns, and here's the new piece. Can you see that? So the bitter end wants to go from the in into the middle off to the side. So therefore, my spike has to go the other way, like this. And I put a bite on the spike. And again, I haven't put too much spike through. And then you roll the spike over this way. <laughs> so I've just, I've rolled my spike out, which pulls the bite of the bitter end through. I'll try and do that one more time. So spike comes in this way, not too much, but the, with slack, a bite of the bitter end over the end of the spike and you're gonna roll this spike try and keep my fingers out of your vision <laughs> roll the spike ugh, up and over to the side and then pull that through we'll do the same thing on the other side so now I come over both frapping turns the bitter end wants to go up into the middle so again my spike goes the opposite way like this, put the bite on the spike and just roll the spike down and through and you've pulled that out. There's your flat knot. 
And here's where we would put it back through here to tension so that it would sink into the seizing. Is the preferred direct, okay, Dennis, hi, Dennis, is the preferred direction with the lay same as with the service? Uh, really doesn't matter. Uh, good question. So when you're putting a seizing on, uh, Dennis is asking which way around am I wrapping? Really doesn't matter, here's why. Um, if it is a fiber on fiber seizing, if you're really gonna whale on it, you're gonna put a tiny bit of canvas underneath. But the risk there is if you're not gonna really crank down on that, the canvas underneath will mean you can't get it tight enough. So this happens a lot um, in traditional sailing ships in our current day and age. People are concerned about cranking on the same twine and having it cut into the service on the shrouds. So they put canvas underneath and the problem is that then the seizing is never tight enough. So don't do that. Uh, the way to avoid it is one, be sure that you need the canvas or not, because you might not. Um, if, the if the service has been there a long time and has had uh, archeological layers of tar on it, you probably don't need it. Just crank the seizing down and it should be fine. And no, it doesn't matter which way around you're going. Um, but if you think you do need the canvas for sure, uh, make sure it's thin canvas. It's not a big piece of old course or mainsail. Mm -mm. It's something thin um, that will still let you squeeze nice and tight. Uh, something to think about though, in terms of which way you're passing it is notice I was always pulling to myself. Make sure you're set up in a way that you're gonna pull toward yourself. You're much stronger that way than if you're on the shrouds trying to push out, that never, it never works. So a comfortable working direction where you're pulling toward yourself is, is best. Okay, this is great, we have questions. Uh, Christopher Finnegan, if turning in a dead eye, because it can't work around our settle, how do you determine how much slack to leave in the tail to end with even tension and mitigate racking? Okay, um, Chris, I'm not sure which seizing we're talking about. So turning in a dead eye, do you mean the seizing that is closing it? Um, Cause that's an entire other session, closing things around. I, I can show this cause it's, it's very common in lots of places. So for example, this seizing that we have here, it's obviously held and worked for a long time. Uh, this is not closed well. So the closing seizing is the one that squishes something together. Um, we'll do We'll do a session on that. Um, so your question. Not the throat seizing. Okay, so not the throat seizing. Are we doing a seizing in the lanyards of a dead eye? <laughs> um, if so, I guess there wouldn't be slack. Okay. Yeah, Chris, try that one again. Also, Jenny, you could try yours again. Question. I'm sure I'm sure it makes sense. I'm just not sure which season we're talking about. Uh, and at some point in the future, we'll have this where we can speak. Um, feel free to give us feedback on that. We're still figuring it out. Okay, here we go. The other two major ones applied to the shroud leg. Okay. Ah, okay. So, so I think the question is that we have this seizing here, and then we have other seizings. Um, you don't want it to rack, so you're not going to account for it. Or right, so you don't, yeah, you don't want it to rack. Everything you do in the closing seizing, you try to set it up so that's not going to happen. Um, and in that case, um, all the sequential seizings that are structural are supposedly helping to hold the tension. So. Um, when you're doing, especially work with wire, you actually pre-tension both the standing end and the tail. So both of those are pulled on beforehand. They should have even tension. And, and then you do them very tight. So unlike the tail seizing in rope where this is gonna settle 
and we left uh, an allowance for that. So in structural rigging, when there are multiple seasons in a row like this, um, you plan, <laughs> you plan for the original seizing not to rack and they all should work together and there should be equal tension on the tail and the standing end of the shroud. Um, can I get a thumbs up if that was the question? <laughs> um, Yeah, so Amy says, yeah, the breaking strength depends on the size of twine. Yeah, so let's look up, because I'm sure you guys have Google right there. Let's look up sane twine, 48 gauge sane twine. That's what we're using here. It's pretty normal for schooners. Okay, awesome. Are there other questions before I carry on? Oh, we are nearly at an hour. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw one more seizing in there just for fun. Okay. So this last one is not as common, but it's still fun and it's good to know because every now and then it might just come in handy. Let's, so let's say you're a, you're on a bark and you, you come into the anchorage and you sail onto the hook. Uh, and one watch is, is stowing the lower topsails and uh, you're going to stern tie your bark to a tree where do I get these examples? Uh, <laughs> so you're gonna have to tie two hawsers together because one certainly won't reach. So you'd probably tie a carrick bend uh, and you're gonna clap on a tail seizing. Why? Because this is gonna drag through the water before it comes tight. So you just wanna hold these together. Um, we wanna do this kind of quick, otherwise the mate's gonna be jumping up and down. So you don't wanna use your spike to tighten all the turns. So we're gonna do a racking seizing. A racking seizing is called such because um, unlike these uh, round seizings, these are both kinds of, yeah, okay, round seizing, um, that should not rack like with what Chris was saying, when the tension comes on one side, if it's not done well, these will angle ka chunk. A racking seizing will angle, but that's okay. We're gonna do this one two part because I'm running short of time here. I'm also tangled. So I've middled it in the same fashion where I put the ends around and then pulled all the way through. And this racking seizing, if you're doing this on the deck, you'd be careful about uh, leaving, again, some allowance for this bitter end to settle. Uh, for our purposes here, I think you get the get the point. I'm gonna do it up higher, just where you can see. I wouldn't really do it here. Okay, with this racking seizing, instead of going all the way around um, the outside, we're gonna make figure eights. So my twine every time is going in between the hawser, making figure eights. <laughs> And I'm just pulling this tight. Um, so the racking seizing specifies that I'm making these figure eights. Again, it doesn't specify that I happen to be doing this two part and I happen to be doing it hand tight. Those are options. A uh, racking seizing is a good choice uh, for something that's particularly slippery, like a modern material um, or, or bare wire or something that's really big, or something that's hard. So my example is maybe a little small on this size, but uh, this is the biggest rope I could find around here. Um, so this is a good way to get extra friction without taking the time to use your spike. So if I'm, in my example, stern tying to a tree, I'm not gonna spike tie to tail seizing, that's... <laughs> Uh, that wouldn't go well. So this is gonna work differently than the uh, round seizing. Just hold this where it is. So a round seizing, uh, we're looking down at the rope. Um, the round seizing squeezes and creates fix friction in between the two legs and that's really what's holding. We also have some friction in the twine around the outside. But again, the twine isn't supposed to transfer the load of the shroud. That's not really what it's for. 
A racking seizing works differently. So the twine goes in between the rope every time. So it's more grabby. It's twice as much friction on the outside of the rope as the round seizing, but you don't get as much friction from squeezing in the middle. Some, yes, but not as much. So I'll carry on here. Uh, racking seizing is well over square, so it's it's decidedly a rectangle. Going round and round. Notice I'm leaving space. I'm doing this pretty quick because we're we're coming up on an hour here, but um, I'm leaving space. I'm not making these match up all together. That's fine. They're just kind of going around straight. Okay, we'll do one more because I want you to be convinced that it's convincingly rectangular. Okay, um, I could end it like this. I could split the ends and uh, do frapping turns. Again, yes, frapping turns significantly better than not. Um, or I could add another layer and I'll do that just so you see how that goes. This time instead of... Um, I'm running out of words here. I'm just gonna wind my way up. And I'm gonna fill in the gas. Um, and I didn't do anything fancy. If it if I was doing this one part, I would probably hitch it. Since I'm doing it two part, the hitch comes out really clunky. So I'm just gonna, and I made these pretty wide because I'm I'm trying to move here. Um, I'm gonna just fill in the gaps on my way up. So now I'm just spiraling around the outside in the gaps that I left on the way down. So I have kind of two rounds of passing turns, but they're not piling up. And I can finish this one the same as the other two part seizing where the ends then divide and go their separate ways. One in through the back and down, one from the front through to the back. And they're gonna switch places at the bottom and join at the top and then we'll finish this in the same normal fashion with a reef knot right over left. Make sure to tension it down in its resting place in between the bits of rope. And then this one left over right, same thing. Tension that down. Okay, that is a racking seizing, a round seizing and a flat seizing. Uh, let's see, what sort of questions do we have here? What is racking? Racking. Uh, okay, again, I can show this because it's very common. Um, and <laughs> it has obviously held a long time. So racking is when the tension on the seizing, that when the seizing didn't hold as well as it should have. Um, and it has turned sideways. Can you see this one? So it, it used, it, it start, when someone made it, it was square, but it didn't squeeze enough. And so it shifted. So that is racking. Okay, it, it is normal. Um, and obviously it's held for us just fine for a very long time. Um, however, it's also avoidable. So uh, when, we, when we do this again, don't worry, they won't do that. Oh, uh, well, another session we'll do wire seizings. Um, other question, what is, why are there gaps in the seizing? So because I was making figure eights, I've kind of buried it now. Um, it's, a, it's the result of the figure eighting. If you do, if try it yourself and you'll see, um, as you do the figure eights, 
the way that they build down uh, ends up leaving a gap every other every other spacing. Um, and you can mush them together so that it doesn't quite do that. Uh, but you, you don't need to, it's a little straighter uh, if you don't. Um, it's been an hour. I'm gonna go ahead and keep wrapping up. If you need to leave, that's fine. Um, we're so excited that you did join in, but I'll go ahead and keep answering a couple questions here. So, um, racking season becomes self-tightening question mark. Yes. So a racking season works a lot like, um, we should find another word for this, but we call them Chinese fingers. Um, did you ever have that toy when you were a kid that you put your fingers in the little woven tube and then you, you pull and you can't get them out? Um, so racking season works kind of like that, where as the tension comes on, uh, it ends up squeezing more. So it does rack, it does do that angled shifty thing and that's okay um, in that case. It works just fine. Looking for more questions. Okay, so I have a uh, one comment. Uh, fun fact: in uh, the 17 and 1800s, and I think it's uh, ironic that I have a, a fun fact about that time period on the live internet stream. So, fun fact: 17 1800s, the lowest shroud seizing usually started with racking turns or alternated between racking and round turns. And the question for pondering I will leave you with is why was that? So thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're excited to launch our Doc Talk series and you can join into the uh, stream or the channel and get information about uh, upcoming events. We're, we're so glad to have everyone here and staying involved in the sailing community even though not a lot of people are sailing. So thank you very much for your questions. Uh, the video will be posted and available on the website and on YouTube, question mark, I think. <laughs> and uh, we're so glad to see everyone today. Okay, we are over an hour, but I had one other thing I was going to show. Should I do it? Can someone write in the chat if they would like to see one other thing? Someone says yes. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so one other thing that I think goes in this category. So rigging is designed to be assembled and disassembled. And at some point you're gonna be done with the seizings. So now what? Um, we're gonna cut them off. And it may or may not be worth your time to save the twine. Um, and that'll be up to the bosun or the mate and uh, don't be insulted if they say that the twine is more valuable. Often it's not. And you're gonna save the twine, you still cut off the frapping turns, slip your knife under the frapping turns and roll up and take your, uh, to cut them off, take your spike in the back, push it through and roll your spike around, pull the frapping turns out of the way. Um, it gets um, loose and then you're able to unwind the rest of the seizing. Oh, I got off here. So obviously this won't do another seizing of the same twi uh, size, <laughs> um, but it's still good for other things. And for the round seizing, um, because this went on something structural, if you're taking it off, you're doing a bigger project, which means it's very likely not worth the time to save the twine. So you're gonna cut it off very carefully. If you make a mistake and cut the lanyard or whatever this is, there's a lot of consequences. So that's something you don't allow yourself to do. So how do you do this? You start with a sharp knife. Starts the same way. Oh, my character is in, in the way here. 
<laughs> uh, slip your knife under the frapping turns and just rock it to cut those. Same as before, um, put your spike in the back and roll your spike around to get the frapping turns out of the way that help, helps it uh, come apart, opposite of how it helped it stay together. And when you cut the seizing, do not hold your knife at an angle. That's how you mess up. So your knife is gonna stay flat, parallel to the seizing the whole time. That's the most successful method for not damaging anything. So you're just gonna gently cut straight into the seizing. You're gonna cut through all of the um, riding turns before all of the round turns. So those should be able to kind of peel off to the side. You're done with those and then just gonna take your time comfortably flat, flat knife and I should stop and sharpen my knife. If you feel like you're struggling at all, stop and sharpen your knife. So here's the end. Just cut carefully through and pull that away. That's a professional way to cut off a seizing without damaging anything. Okay, that was a little, uh, little encore. <laughs> They're also important. Okay. <laughs> wow, great. Thanks to see, uh, it's good to see everyone. Thank you so much for your, your comments and questions. That makes it a lot more interactive and uh, fun for me. So hope to see you next time and uh, take care everyone until then.